Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Monday Bible study, your Monday Bible study. And I thank the Lord that we're always here. And as we learn the word of God together, I pray that the Lord himself will open our eyes to all that he's revealing to us and will be the better for it in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you for this time. I will thank you for the way you've been leading us and teaching us, instructing and guiding us to all truth. We're asking, oh Lord, tonight as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're asking that your Spirit will guide, your Spirit will teach, and your Spirit will open our eyes of understanding to your words tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, you'll be glorified in our lives as our light will shine according to the teaching, the revelation of your word. Lord, we pray that more of your spirit, more of the understanding, more of the guidance will be upon every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, give us maximum concentration on your word today. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we are moving forward in our study of the gospel according to St. Mark. Tonight, we are in Mark chapter 14. And we're studying from verse 1 all through to verse 21. Actually, it's a long passage, but it's a simple passage. And as we look at the passage today, we're talking about preparation for the last Passover. Preparation for the last Passover. I'm sure you've heard about that before. The Passover started from the Old Testament, from Exodus chapter 12. And the children of Israel were supposed to carry on with that Passover. It was when the Lord delivered the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Before that uh, deliverance, he gave them the plan of redemption. And he told them what to do. You know the story perhaps. They'll take a lamb. And the lamb will be without blemish. And they will keep that lamb for four days. Then on the appointed day, they will sacrifice that lamb. And when they shed the blood of the lamb, because God said the angel of death was going to pass through the land of Egypt. Judgment was going to come upon the people, the whole land. And it's uh, symbolic. And it is reminding us that this world is under the anger of God, under the judgment of God. And yet there is a provision made for anyone that will escape from that judgment of God. So God said they will apply the blood of the lamp upon the lintels of their houses. And then when the angel passing by in the night, when he sees that blood, God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's exactly what he did. And as they did that, all through that night, all the children of uh, Israel, they were preserved in uh, their houses. But they were told none of them must go out of their houses. They will remain under the shed, of, under the blood. And under the protection of the blood, they remained and abode there. And the angel of death passed by. In all the houses of the Egyptians, where the mark of the blood was not, there was the death of the firstborn all over the land. In fact, it says, both of the bees and of the animals. And then eventually they are to come up. But you see, that Passover was observed with the eating of the flesh of that animal they had slain as they applied the blood. And also the bread they took, it was to be on living bread. That's why uh, you'll find in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, that it says is the Passover of the unleavened bread. And tonight, as we come to Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 1 to verse 21, it says very clearly they were to have all that they would do for the Passover. Before that Passover, the Lord Jesus Christ was in the house. And in that house, a woman came and poured the alabaster box of oil upon him. And that ointment, a costly ointment already, and people gave the price. It was something that she did in preparation for the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in certain those first nine verses, we now have the Passover itself. 
as they were going to observe the last Passover. And then during that time, the Lord warned the soul disciples about the betrayal. And he said about the one that will betray him and the consequences that will come upon that betrayal. That, in summary, is what you have in verses 1 to 21. And the topic, as I've told you, is preparation for the last Passover. There are three points we're looking at. Number one, the price of anointing is unblemished body. The price of anointing is unblemished body. That body without sin. And remember that the land they were to have for the Passover will be without blemish, will be without spot, will be without uh, any deformity. And that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ that will come. And he came and he was sinless, he was spotless, he was holy, he was righteous through and through within and without. And his body was unblemished. His body and his life was, uh, was spotless. And so you have this person that came and anointed the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the price of that anointing, the cost of that anointing, and the price that was paid to get that uh, oil of anointing all poured upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one then is the price of anointing his unblemished body. Number two, we're going to find, as we saw it tonight, the Passover itself appointed with unleavened bread. Uh, leaven is a symbol of sin, and leaven is a symbol of evil. And the Lord wanted to emphasize that as we come to Christ, and as we have that uh, Passover, and it will pass over us, there is the Passover, and it is appointed with the unleavened bread. And there you have uh, this last one now in the passage we're looking at tonight, the perdition awaiting uh, the unrepentant betrayer. The Lord Jesus gave warning. And as he gave the warning, he did that over and over on the betrayer that will come. And he says, if that betrayer did not repent, that this is what will happen, the woe and the warning on that betrayer. Number three, the perdition awaiting uh, the unrepentant betrayer. Now we're coming to point number one. In point number one, the price of anointing is unblemished body. We're reading now from Mark chapter 14, and I'm reading from verse 1. Mark chapter 14, we're looking at verse 1. It says, after two days was the feast of the Passover, and of the unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft, underline that in your Bible, by craft, they were crafty, they were hypocritical, they were not sincere. And although they were saying they found accusation against the Lord Jesus Christ, it was all set up and it was by craft. And it says they wanted to put him to death. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, but they said not on the feast day. They didn't want to do it at that time. Why? Because they feared the opera. They said not on the feast day, lest there be an opera of the people. And now we come to verse 3. And it says in verse 3, And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of sparkled very precious, very precious. Other uh, writers, other gospel, uh, like Matthew, like Luke, they say very costly. And she break the box and put it on his head. He put it on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ, anointing him. Look at verse 4. It says in verse 4, And there were some that had indignation within themselves, why did they have indignation? Look at this. And they said, why was this waste of the ointment made? In verse 5 it says, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. That was their indignation. That was their anger. That such a costly uh, bottle of oil should just be poured on the Lord Jesus Christ like that. You remember? That the daily workers at that time, daily wage workers at that time, they received a penny a day. 
And that means that when you talk of uh, uh, this oil costing 300 pence, it will mean that it will be the salary of the daily wage earners for 300 days. And when you take away the servers that they will not work, it's like literally for a whole year. And then that brought the anger to them. They could, she could have sold that ointment for 300 pence and have given to the poor. That's what they thought. They said that this is not uh, good for Christ. It's too much for Christ. You could have given to the poor. They were elevating, exalting the poor above the Lord Jesus Christ. And they murmured against her. And then it says in verse 6, in verse 6 it says, And Jesus said, Let her alone. Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She has wrought a good work on me what they complained about, and what they derided her for, what they disdained her for, Jesus said she had wrought a good work on me. What he said she should not have done. She shouldn't have given all that to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ that should have been given to the poor. He said, he said, trouble her not, because she has wrought a good work on me. Then in verse 7, in verse 7 he says, For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good, but me ye have not always. He was still reminding them of his death. He was still reminding them of his burial. You don't have me always. He was reminding them that even when he rose from the dead, when he will rise from the dead, he will ascend to heaven. And they will have all the poor with them for thousands of years that they can take care of them. He said, but me ye have not always. In verse 8, he tells us, she has done what she could, and she is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burial. And then in verse 9, verse 9 says, Verily I say unto you, assuredly I say unto you, certainly I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world. Are you learning something here? Even though Jesus Christ was facing the cross, even though Jesus Christ was going to Calvary, and yet he was still reminding the disciples and reminding the church, we're going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said, anywhere we go preaching the, uh, preaching the gospel, anywhere we go demonstrating that Christ has died, and Christ has given his life, his blood, for an atonement for our sins, that everywhere we go will be preaching throughout the whole world. This also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. As we look at those verses 1 through to 9, the three things we're looking at, number one, is the plan of arresting him by craft. The plan of arresting him by craft. And then point number two there is the price of anointing Christ. The price of anointing Christ. And then number three is the preaching of his atoning cross. The preaching of his atoning cross. Come to number one is the plan of arresting him by craft. It says in verses one and two, Mark chapter 14, verses one and two, tells us about their craft and tells us about their hypocrisy. It says, and after two days was the feast of the Passover and of the unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him, look at this, by craft, how they might take him by lying, how they might take him by deception, how they might take him by just uh, formulating uh, some plot around him and put him to death. And then in verse 2, they said, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people, the plan of arresting him by craft. You know, anyone that is uh, doing anything like that today, wanting to rope people into trouble, wanting to get them into trouble, and they do it by craft, and they do it by planning, and they do it by plotting. They are following those who took Jesus Christ and arrested Jesus Christ by craft. And if they follow the same path, they're going to end in the same place. In fact, it says it's not just at that time. They have been planning this ahead of time. If you look at John chapter 11, reading from verse 47, 
you will see that days have been the plan, days had been the plot for a long time. John 11, verse 47, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. That's the real problem. And that was the real sin they were against. They said, what are we looking at and what are we doing this man? Instead of calling his name Jesus, instead of calling him Christ, instead of calling him the Son of God, instead of calling him the Messiah, instead of calling him the righteous, and they just said, this man doeth many miracles. They will not even openly affirm that this is the prophet that was to come. They just said, this man doeth many miracles. Then look at what he said in verse 48. In verse 48, he said, if we let him thus alone, that was their problem. If we leave him, let him, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. What's the problem in that? All men will believe in him. Is the Messiah. That's the right thing people should do. Is the Christ. That's the right thing people should do. Is the Savior of the world. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away all the sin of the world. That's exactly what the people should do. All men will believe on him. But then they said that the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. They were politically motivated. And they said, we don't want this to happen, that to happen. And because of their political ambition, they said, if we let him alone, and he keeps on working the miracles, all men are going to believe on him, and the Romans will come. And they will take both our place and our nation. Then in verse 49, it's now that one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest, that same year said unto them, you know nothing at all. You don't know what strategy we can put in place. And you don't know what plot we can generate. And you don't know what crash we can do to instigate the public and to say they should crucify him. It says in verse 50, in verse 50 it says, Now consider that it is expedient for us, not for the world, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. He did understand. He was prophesying and he was declaring what Christ will do, but he was doing this by craft. He was doing this so that they could get rid of Christ. And he said, you know nothing at all that it is expedient, it is profitable for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. In verse 51, now we're told, and this speak he not of himself, they speak he, not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied. He didn't know he was prophesying. He prophesied. He didn't know he was declaring the mind of God. He prophesied. He didn't know that this had already been decided by God. This had been decided from eternity past before the foundation of the world. He didn't know it was prophecy. He just said it out of, uh, you know, his own uh, craftiness. Said it out of his own plotting. And he said, you know nothing at all that it is profitable for us. It's expedient for us that one man die. And it says, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Not even for that nation. You know, look at verse 52. In verse 52, and not for that nation only, but that also it should gather together in one the children of God that was scattered abroad. Now in verse 53, look at verse 53. It says, then from that day forth, then from that day forth, they took counsel together to put him to death. They took counsel together that they will put him to death. That was the plot and that was the direction in which they were going. In fact, it says, if you go back to Psalm 2 reading from verse 1, all these have been prophesied, all these have been written, even aforetime. And Jesus said, he came to fulfill all things that were written concerning him. Look at this in Psalm 2. Please open your Bible. Very important. We're studying the Bible. Uh, you are not just uh, listening and watching the preacher. It says, why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing? 
craftiness, a vain sin, hypocrisy, that's their vain sin, the plot, that's the vain sin, and all that the council was putting together, and they say, we'll do it this way and do it that way, and we will take him by subtlety. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain sin? Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, the kings of the earth search themselves like Caiaphas, the high priest, like those rulers of the Jews, like those people in the land of Israel. It says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. That's exactly what happened eventually in John chapter 11 that we read together already. They take the two counsel together against the Lord, against the Heavenly Father, and against his anointed, against God and Christ, against the Lord. Lord, that's, that's God, and is anointed. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And what were they saying? Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, they were saying, let us break their bands asunder. Uh, that's, that's what it means uh, when it says, uh, he doeth many miracles, and if he continues like this, all the people will believe on him, uh, and then he'll have control over them. Let's break all those bands asunder. Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cause from from us, look at verse 4. It says in verse 4, He that seated in the heavens, the Almighty God shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. In verse 6, it says, in verse 5, it says, Then shall he speak again unto them in his wrath. In fact, they themselves said, Let his blood be upon us, that they were ready to bear the consequence of what they were doing. He said, That's right, that's right. It's exactly as it was prophesied. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And so you understand that this is what had been prophesied before. We'll come to Matthew now, come back to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 1. In Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things, when Jesus had finished all these things, he had been talking to his own disciples, and they had been answering the questions they asked in Matthew chapter 24 about the end of the world, about the sign of your coming, and about the temple being destroyed. And when he finished all those things in Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25, after finishing all that, he said unto his disciples, now in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, Ye know that after two days at the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. The death did not come to him by surprise. Before he was born, he knew. For this purpose came I into the world. And when he was uh, getting those disciples together, he knew that this was going to be the end. And now he said, the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. In verse 4, it says in verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety. They were going to take him by deception. They were going to take him by lying. They were going to take him by craft. They were going to take him and plot against him and kill him. Then in verse 5, it says in verse 5, but he said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. They knew that all those recipients of the miracles that he had performed, they knew that they would rise up and kick against that. Because you see, at that feast, all the Jews came from everywhere, just like on the day of Pentecost, when they came from all the places to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. They said, there will be so many people. And if we carry out the, the plot, if we carry out the plan, if we carry out uh, the craft, at the time when those people are here, there will be an uproar of the people. Well, it's established now in the Word of God. It's established in your understanding that when they took Jesus Christ and they arrested him, it was by craft. Let's come back to Mark. In Mark chapter 14, 
We're reading verses 3 to 5. This is the price of anointing Christ. The price of anointing Christ. It says, and being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and put it on his head. He breaks the box very costly. He broke the uh, box, that is the alabaster box of ointment, and he put and he put and he put on his head. Her love was so much that there was a great outpouring of the most precious thing that she had. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, And there was some that had indignation within themselves. Within themselves. Can you imagine that Jesus Christ who healed so many people, Jesus Christ who worked so many miracles, Jesus Christ who fed the hungry, and Jesus Christ who did for them what no man had done. In fact, Jesus did for them what the whole nation had not done for them. And then for a woman to take an alabaster box of ointment and put it on Jesus, that, that's good. That's what it, that's what it was worth and the effort because of who Jesus was. Can you imagine people having indignation within themselves because of what that woman had done, honoring Jesus, exalting Christ, and pouring that ointment upon him? And they said it was a waste. It was a waste. Why was this waste? Of the ointment made. Stop there for a moment. When you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been pursuing a particular cause, and then you turn around and you say, Now all your love and all your faithfulness and all your loyalty, all your obedience, everything the rest of your life, you are going to pour your life out for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are people that are going to say, What a waste of life, and what a waste of talent, and what a waste of ability. He could have been doing this. He could have been doing that. He could have been somebody in this area of profession. He could have been somebody else in this area of profession. They call it a waste. But the woman did not listen to them. The woman did not stop what she was doing just because there were people that they did not understand, did not agree with her sacrificial giving. You must not stop when you are sacrificing. You must not stop when you are given a costly a service unto the Lord and you are pouring your life and you are pouring your love upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though people might say it's a waste, you are wasting your time, you are wasting your life, you are wasting your talent, you are wasting your resources, all the same keep on doing what you are doing. Eternity will reveal that you are wise, wiser than those people. They said, why was this waste of ointment made? Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, for it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. There are, all, there are always those calculators. They are calculating and calculating. You know, if we give, instead of giving this to God, all the tithes and all the offering, instead of giving this to Christ, all your ability and all your knowledge, instead of pouring this on Christ, everything you've got, they are calculating, you know, if you are in this business, if you are in that profession, if you are in that area, this is what you could make in life. Don't mind them keep on sowing and keep on pouring and keep on giving and keep on sacrificing everything you've got to the Lord. They said it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Do you know there are people like that today? They said, instead of serving God, you know what you could do on Sunday? You go to spend all that time in the church, and you go to spend all those hours in the church and say you are serving God. You could have gone to the street. You could have gone to the poor. You could have done this. You could have done that. You could become this or that. But you know, that's the way the world always thinks, and that's why they always murmur. But we thank God that this woman continued and did what she ought to do. In fact, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. It says, 
Paul, ye are bought with a price. Already God owns you. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which belong to God. The world will not agree with you. And the Judases of the world will not agree with you. The backsliders will not agree with you. The prodigals who have gone to the far country and all they can think about is the world. All they can think about is selling this ointment and then uh, giving it to the poor. All they can think about is the world that now is. All they can think about is the need of the hour at this time. They don't think about eternity, but you understand you are bought with a price. Therefore, now you are glorifying God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God. Actually, as you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 14, you see the logic and you see the importance of this, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Look at what he has done. He led his throne in eternity. And he led all the peace and all the adoration and all the worship of the angels in eternity. And he came to this world. He was born in a manger. And he went through this life having nothing. He made himself poor that you might be rich. He made himself a sacrifice for sin that you might be saved. And he made himself to have all that suffering and all that agony. You remember his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember his cry on the cross of Calvary. All for you. Well, if Christ has loved us so much and he has done that for us, the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, he died for you, he died for you. And if somebody gave his life for you, is it a tumor to give him an hour? Is it a tumor to give him a day? Is it a tumor to give him your life? And precious things in your life and go witness and go evangelize and go obey him and go carry out the great commission if one died for all, then were all dead. Look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, and that he died for all, because he died for you, and he died for me, and he died for your family, that whosoever in your family, whosoever will turn away from sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll be saved, he'll be forgiven, he'll be set free, and he will write your name, their names in the book of life. And it will take them to heaven when they die, only because of his death, only because of his sacrifice. And that he died for all, look at this, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. We should pour that same costly ointment upon the Lord. We should think about Christ, everything we do, everywhere we go. All the hours we spent every day and all our talent and all our skill, everything now to pour on the Lord Jesus Christ, that they which live shall not henceforth from today, from this time on now, shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. How are you spending your life? The costly things in your life, how do you spend those things? Your ability, very costly. Your intelligence, very costly. And your skill, very costly. And the knowledge of God, very costly. Your certificate is very costly. Yes, all the hours you put into that, all the years you put into that, to be able to earn this, to be able to have this. Are you using that? Are you using that selfishly, only for yourself? Do you remember the one that died for you? And now you can surrender everything. You can submit everything and serve the Lord. I pray you serve the Lord. And as the Lord has recorded a testimony concerning this a woman that did this, the same, you also be recorded to you in Jesus' name. Number one is the plan of arresting him by Christ. Number two is the price of anointing Christ. Number three, now look at what Jesus said in Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 6. And you're going to notice verse 9 in particular, but let me read from verse 6. It says, and Jesus said, let her alone. Let her alone. Are you a believer? And you are not offering everything you've got to the Lord. And another believer is offering everything he has got for the Lord. Let him alone. Don't disturb him. 
don't stop him, don't hinder him, don't discourage him, don't say, I think I need to talk to you. Don't th you think you're giving too much, you're sacrificing too much, don't you think you're evangelizing too much, don't you think you're endangering your life, don't you think of this, don't you think of that, let him alone, let her alone. Is your husband giving so much to the Lord? Praise the Lord, let him alone. Is your wife giving so much to the Lord? Praise the Lord, let her alone. Do you think that that friend, that neighbor, that brother, that sister is offering so much to the Lord? Praise the Lord, let him alone, let her alone. Why trouble ye him? Why trouble ye her? She has wrought a good work on me. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, we will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. That opportunity will not always be there to witness to this person now. Do it. Because that opportunity will not always be there to talk about Christ to, to your village and to talk about Christ to this generation. That opportunity will not always be there. You, you said, but I think we can always preach. Yes, I understand. But you understand, humanity is like water. And they are flowing, the water is flowing under the bridge. And the water that you see there at this port today is not the water that was there yesterday. The one that was just there yesterday had gone. And now you have a new stream. What I'm saying is the opportunity you have to talk to somebody now. It, it may not be there tomorrow. The message is still there. The minister may still be there, but the people may not be there. Therefore, that opportunity you have, do good unto them and preach the word unto them. For me, ye have not always. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, She has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verse 9 now. Verse 9 says, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Preaching of his, the preaching of his atoning cross. That's what we're preaching now. And it says everywhere we go, we'll preach that word, his cross. We'll preach that word, his, his blood. We'll preach that word about his sacrifice. And we'll preach what he has done for humanity. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. That's why when you're preaching, don't worry, some people say that's foolish. You're giving too much of your time, that's foolish. And you are emphasizing, uh, exalting, and elevating Christianity above this and above that. They'll think it is foolish because to them, they think that all roads lead to Rome. To them, they think that all uh, ways of worship, they say they are the same. Whether you take this way or that way, you come through the right or you come through the left, they say everything is the same. Therefore, when you elevate the cross and when you exalt Christ and when you say this is the only way, the narrow way, the way of redemption that leads to heaven, to them, the preaching of the cross is it's foolishness because they are perishing, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Look at verse 23 there. In verse 23 it says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks a foolishness. In verse 24 it says, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. In Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 8. It says in chapter 5 of Romans, verse 8, For God commended his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the preaching of the gospel. That's the preaching of the cross. That's the preaching of Christ, our Savior, Christ, our Redeemer. Christ, 
our sufficiency. It says God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this, by whom we have, we have now received the atonement. We have now received the atonement. It tells us in Paul said, John chapter 2, reading from verses 1 and 2. First John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It's talking about Christ, Christ as Savior. It's talking about Christ, Christ the final sacrifice. It's talking about Christ. It's talking about Him, the propitiation for our sin. It says, little children, these six write I unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice. Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. And then he says in verse 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. He is the sacrifice for our sins. He is the one that has made a full atonement, a complete atonement, an acceptable atonement before God he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only. He says we are saved. What others are still going to be saved. He says we are in. And some outsiders are still going to come in. He says and not for ours only. But also for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world. That you find what Christ has done. And you must tell everyone. And Jesus said the preaching of the gospel and the preaching of the cross, and the preaching of that atonement will be everywhere. We come to point number two now. In point number two, this is the Passover appointed by the Lord, the Passover appointed by the Almighty God with the unleavened bread. We're looking at uh, Mark chapter 14. Let me read from verse 12. In Mark chapter 14, we're reading from verse 12. On the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, they killed the Passover, and it was the time, the day of the unleavened bread, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? Look at verse 13. In verse 13 it says, And he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and says unto them, Go ye into the city. And there shall, there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. In verse 14, it tells us, And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house. The master says, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And then it tells us in verse 15, it says in verse 15, and it will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. And in verse 16, it says, and his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them. Can you stop there for a moment? You see, when he said what he said to his disciples, uh, they didn't know how they, are going, they were going to meet the man. And everything he said had either immediate fulfillment or the one that is going to have a future fulfillment. That's why he said, heaven and I shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Understand, he said that. He said, go this way. You will meet a man. Follow that man and the house he gets to. Tell the good man of that house where he said we can prepare that the master will lead the Passover with his disciples. And they did that and they found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. They made ready the Passover. As we're talking about the Passover, Already I told you the story at the beginning, at the introduction of this Bible study. There is, number one, the first Passover. The first Passover. There is, number two, the final Passover, which is what was taking place now. And then there is, number three, the fulfilled Passover. Number one, the first. Number two, the final. 
number three, the fulfilled Passover. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, we're reading from verse 5. We're talking about the first Passover. When the first, when the first Passover was uh, established, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. In verse 6, it says, in verse 6, it says, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Actually, every family, each family, will take a lamb without blemish. And then at the right time, as they were appointed to do, each family will kill that lamb without blemish and without spot. And they will apply the blood upon the lintels of their houses. Look at verse 12 now. In verse 12 of that same chapter 12, it says, For I will pass, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn, underline that word all, everyone that does not come under the mark of the blood, the blood of the spotless lamb, the blood of the lamb without blemish, I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, the saving grace for them the protection for them, the deliverance for them, their salvation, their redemption will come on the basis of the blood that was shed. In verse 13 it says, And the blood shall be to you for a token, for a sign, upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague and the judgment and the calamity and the devastation and the destruction and the death shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And they did that from generation to generation because that is what the Lord had instructed them to do. Look at Numbers chapter 9. In Numbers chapter 9, looking at verse 2. Numbers Chapter 9, please open your Bible. And if any verse is new to you, you underline that verse. So when you are going over and reading your Bible again, you will remember this, the word that the Lord himself had given. It says in Numbers chapter 9, verse 2, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover. Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover. Let the children of Israel, this is for the children of Israel, not for the church. It says, let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. At his appointed season. Then we come to Deuteronomy chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 16, reading from verse 1. Here now the Lord was telling them how they will keep this and the place where they will keep. The month, he told them, the day, he told them, and the place where they will keep that Passover. From generation to generation, he gave unto them, he said, observe the month of, the month of Abim and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. They were doing it. Not unto Moses, they were doing it unto the Lord. And keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of, the, out of Egypt by night. And then he tells us in verse 2, it says in verse 2, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God. Remember, if Moses was still alive unto the Lord thy God, if Moses was not alive unto the Lord thy God, this one was not tied to Moses. It was a remembrance of what the Lord had done for them. He redeemed them. He saved them. He brought them out of the land of bondage, out of the land of captivity. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and of the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. In the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Now, let, let me just uh, uh, make an allusion to this. You know, the Lord's Supper that became, that became instituted by Christ himself after uh, the Passover was gone. 
that same we should remember this also when we come together as people of God, then we keep the Lord's Supper. It will reserve the dignity and the reverence and the honor. Not just that. Everyone, you know, in their house, in their kitchen, in their parlor, in their sitting room, or wherever, in their bedroom, then they'll say, you know, I'm a Christian, and the Lord says you should take the Lord's Supper, and then we're taking the Lord's Supper in every house and every place. No, not at all. In the place that the Lord himself shall choose to put his name there. Let's give the honor to the Lord, and let's give the glory to the Lord, and let's give the reverence unto the Lord. That was the first uh, Passover that they, were to, that they were to observe. Look at Joshua chapter 5, uh, and I'm reading from verse 2. Joshua chapter 5, uh, we're looking at verse 2. There's something important for us to understand here as we talk about the Passover for the children of Israel. The children of Israel had been in the wilderness all those 40 years. I'm sure you know the story. And the people that were born in the wilderness were not circumcised. And now they came to the land of promise and they came to the land of Canaan. And remember, from year to year, in the place where God has appointed, they will keep on observing the Passover. How about the people that were not circumcised? Because you understand, for the children of Israel, anyone that is not circumcised will be cut off from among the people. And so they could not just jump over, over that circumcision and say they were keeping the Passover. Look at Joshua chapter 5, verse 2. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. He's talking about you circumcise the children of Israel who had not been circumcised. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but, look at this, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. And they are now grown, you know, 40 years, some of them now will be 20, some of them 25, some of them 37, some of them even 40. And they had not been circumcised, and they were to keep the Passover. First, they'll make sure that they are circumcised. And it tells us in verse 8, in verse 8, it says, uh, in verse 8, it says, And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And then in verse 9, it says, in verse 9, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I ruled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Important verse, verse 10 now. In verse 10 it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal. Look at this. After that circumcision, catch the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. Which means then, as we look at that uh, post Passover, all the things that the Lord had appointed, they were to observe everything as the Lord appointed. And number two now is the final Passover that brings us back to Mark chapter 14. And reading from verse 12, Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 12, here is the final Passover. The children of Israel had been celebrating, had been observing the Passover all the centuries of their history. And then the final, the last Passover was to be observed. And it says in Mark chapter 14, verse 12, And the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare uh, that thou mayest eat the Passover. Uh, come to Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 7. Luke chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 
20 from verse 7. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread. Do you see that you know all the writers, all the people that God used to write, whether Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, it's unleavened bread, unleavened bread. The leaven must not be there. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And then in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, And it sent Peter and John, he sent Peter and John, hold on. He could have sent uh, Peter and Andrew because they were associated together. Andrew brought uh, Peter to Christ, but no. He could have chosen John and James because they were sons of Zebedee together. No, you know, it's not according to the natural thing you think of. This is who he should send and that is who he should send. But he sent Peter and John. And isn't it wonderful that this one continued? Acts chapter 3, Peter and John. And then when they were thrown into the prison, Peter and John. John, and when they were going to Samaria, because the people of Samaria had received the word of God, Peter and John, notice everything, all these details in the word of God, very important for us to learn and very important for us to go by. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And then he tells us in verse 9, in verse 9, and they said unto him, Where wilt thou? that will prepare the Passover. Then in verse 13, it says, in verse 13, it says, And they went and found, as he had said unto them, the promptness of obedience and the completeness of obedience and the willingness in obedience. They didn't question. He said, Go, and he just went. And they found, as he had said unto them, and the mage ready. And John gives us another side of this period in John chapter 13, reading from verse 1. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. His hour was come. You know, many times I've told them, my hour is not yet. John chapter 2, my hour is is not yet. And when they were to take him, they couldn't take him because his hour was not yet. And when the, uh, when the friends and the Israelites said, are you not going to the feast? My hour is not yet. But now he knew that his hour was come. If you knew your hour, if you knew your time, if you knew your time of opportunity, you will not uh, throw that off and throw that off at every time of opportunity. You know, this is my hour. This is my time. You'll do what the Lord has appointed for you to do. When Jesus knew that the hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, even in that time there was craft, craftiness, hypocrisy, and plot. They were going to take him, he was going to be crucified. Even in the midst of that, he loved his own and he loved them unto the end. We've seen the first Passover. I will see now the observance of the final Passover, now the fulfilled Passover. We're coming to First Corinthians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 7. But out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new love, as ye are unleavened, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us as we profess that we belong to Christ. As we profess that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us, we keep that Passover with unleavened bread. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or we and wickedness, but with the living bread of sincerity and truth. It makes the application of that unleavened bread of the old covenant, and it comes to the new covenant, and it says we should observe the Passover with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It tells us in, uh, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, uh, what to do away with all the leaven. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, looking at verse 6, 
Here is Jesus talking to his own disciples. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. As we now, as uh, New Testament believers and children of God, and we are under the mark of the blood of the Lamb. Now we must not have the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Sadducees. What does that mean? Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, in verse 12, it says, Then understood them how he bid them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, as we now stay under the mark of the blood of the Lamb, the spotless Lamb and the sinless Lamb, and the Lamb that was sacrificed for us. And it says, when I see the blood of Christ upon you as a child of God, I will pass over you. There must not be any leaven with us. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 9. A little leaven leaveth the whole lump. We cannot excuse now any appearance of evil. We cannot excuse now and say that's a small sin. We cannot excuse now and say that's a little defilement. I didn't go into the real thing. I only did this. I only did this. It says a little leaven leaveth the whole lump. And as we are now under the mark of the blood of Jesus, a little leaven is not allowed. A little sin is not allowed. A little appearance of evil is not allowed. That's why it says in, uh, look at verse 19 uh, of that Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 19. Uh, now, the works of the flesh are manifest. Here is the leaven that must not be in our lives as children of God who know that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. He says, adultery, no, not at all, must not be there. Fornication must not be there. Uncleanness must not be there. Lasciviousness, no, it must not be there. Look at verse 20, or idolatry, or witchcraft, or hatred, or variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. In verse 21, envies, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such lies. All that kind of leaven of evil, the leaven of sin, and the leaven of the works of the flesh must not be in our lives anymore. It says of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You understand that? As somebody cannot say, I believe in Christ, it's my Passover. All that the Lord is looking at now is the blood. When I say the blood, I will pass over you. He says, that's right, but you must understand, you stay at home, you stay indoors under the mark of the blood. If you go out and you go into the world and you mix with the world and you have all this adultery, fornication and all the lasciviousness and all the drunkenness and the murders and the envies, all the works of the flesh, all the hatred, it says you are gone out of the under the, from under the mark of the blood and it says you will not hear in the kingdom of God. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 1, Say, verse 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It makes holiness still central. Holiness is still important. Holiness is still indispensable. In fact, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And therefore, we remain under the cleansing of the blood. And we remain consecrated, committed under that blood. And we remain holy and righteous, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We've seen uh, the Passover appointed ways or living bread. We're coming now to the final section of this uh, passage we're studying today. And it is, uh, it is the perdition awaiting the unrepentant betrayer. The perdition awaiting the unrepentant betrayer. We're coming to Mark 
chapter 14, verse 10. In Mark chapter 14, verse 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest and be, to betray him unto them. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, and when they heard it, they were glad. They were looking for a way that uh, they will take Jesus by craft. They will take him and plot and then put some things, uh, give him some accusation and then uh, crucify him. And they were looking for a way to get at him. And they were looking for a way to reach him so that they can arrest him by craft. And when they heard that one of his disciples offered that he was going to do this, when they heard that one of his disciples I did not actually love Christ that much, I did not be with Christ, was not so intimate with Christ, and he was just a hypocrite in living there and staying there, and came to them wanting to betray Christ unto them. It says they were glad, and they promised to give him money, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. I come to verse 17. In verse 17 it says, and in the evening he cometh with the twelve. He was still there, acting as if he was one of them, remaining with them, with the twelve, with the assembly. In the evening he cometh with the twelve. And then in verse 18, in verse 18, as at the start, and did he, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you, which eater with me shall betray me. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, and he began to be sorrowful and to say unto him, one by one, is it I? In fact, they, they, became, they started doubting themselves. Could it be my heart? And I didn't think about that. Am I a hypocrite? Am I a prodigal? Am I a backslider? Could I ever think I will betray my Lord? And one by one they were asking, you know, this, this is a statement to have made. One of you will betray me. Is it I? You know, you shouldn't take anything for granted. Always ask yourself. Uh, when it says uh, not everyone will endure to the end, is it I? One will fall into temptation, is it I? One will yield to the flesh, is it I? One will betray the Lord, and one will go to the world and then sell the church of Christ, the bride of Christ into the world. Don't be so sure of yourself and say, well, I know he's talking about other people. One by one, they ask him, is it I? And another said, is it I? And then the Lord said in verse 20, he said, and he answered and said, unto them. It is one of the twelve, not one of the seventy. It is one of the twelve. It is one of those people that could have become great apostles. It's one of those people that could have had the Holy Ghost upon him on the day of Pentecost. It's one of those people, very close and very intimate, that have given power, have given authority to go and deliver the oppressed and heal the sick, and have given everything I've got from heaven, I've given unto all of you twelve. It is one of you, one of the twelve, that deepens with me in the dish, unimaginable, unthinkable. And then in verse 21, in verse 21, the Son of Man indeed goeth as it is reaching of him. But woe to that man. Woe to that betrayer. Woe to that traitor. Woe to that backslider. Woe to that apostate. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, the warning. Number two, the willfulness. Number three, the woe. Number one, the warning for the betrayer. Number two, the willfulness of the betrayer. Number three, the woe for the betrayer. Come to number one, the warning for the betrayer. The Lord warned him. Look at Matthew chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 26, we're reading from verse 24. In Matthew chapter 26, here is the warning, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. It couldn't have been clearer. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? 
that man was bold and his face was still plastic. And he said, when Jesus repeated and repeated and repeated that warning, you know what he said? He said, Master, he called him Master. He called him Lord. That's why Jesus said, not everyone that calls me Master, not everyone that calls me Lord, not everyone that calls me Savior, not everyone that calls me King shall inherit the kingdom of God. But they that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, Judas called him Master. Are you there today? You say Lord, you say Master, you say King, you say Savior, you say Redeemer. Are you born again? Are you transformed? Are you changed? Are your sins forgiven? Do you have the new life? Are you a new creature in Christ? And do you have the love of God that you will not sell the Lord? You'll not sell the cross? You'll not sell Calvary? You'll not sell the sacrifice for at any price? And you'll not deny the Lord? You'll not just say, Master and Lord? But Judah said, Master, is it high? Look at this. He said unto him, Christ said unto Judas, Thou hast said, you are the man. And with that warning, you would have thought that he will just remove his hand and he will say, I'm not going to do that. Do you know that in that same chapter 26, he betrayed Christ and then he took Jesus Christ and they led him to the cross, that they were going to crucify him. Look at chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, he was now regretting. This one is not repentance. He had remorse. This one is not repenting. He had regret for what he had done. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, he had done that. Look at this. We're just in chapter 27, number 3. He did it before the end of that Chapter 26, after he asked the Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, that was, that was said. And he still went ahead and did that. And now we're told that Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, that his Christ was condemned and Christ was taken and were going to crucify him, he repented himself. He regretted in himself. And he had remorse and he had sorrow for what he had done when he saw the consequence. And he brought again the 30 pieces of silver and uh, to the chief priests and elders. Look at verse 4. And they were told, saying, I have sinned. No use confessing to them. Confess to God. No use confessing to the Pharisees. The Pharisees cannot forgive you. The chief priests cannot forgive you. The church fathers cannot forgive you. And those who placed themselves there and they hated Christ and they were going to crucify Christ and they hate the pure religion. They cannot forgive you. It was confessing to the wrong person. Saying, I have sinned uh, in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See ye to that. Look at the pitiable thing, the sorrowful thing that took place in verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple. Hold on. Why are you running after the money you will not spend? Why are you running after the things you will not use? Why are you running after the things that will not profit you? It says he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and Tell me there your Bible. And wait, I say, shout it for me, your Bible. Thank you. Hand himself, hand himself. He killed himself. And Jesus said, it were better he were not born. He took his own life. He committed suicide. And you know where he has gone? Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 16. It says, men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas. The Holy Ghost spake concerning Judas, and Jesus spake concerning Judas, and the scriptures spake concerning Judas. You know, if somebody is going to um, escape the judgment of the final day, what the Holy Ghost has said, he must be mindful of that. What Jesus has said, he must be mindful of that. What the scripture has said, he must be mindful of that. That is, it said this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them 
that took Jesus. It says in verse 17, in verse 17, for he was numbered with us, one of the twelve. He was numbered with us, one of the apostles. He was numbered with us, one of the people that should be preaching the gospel. He was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bias gushed out. In verse 19, it says, And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, in their proper language, a seldom. That is to say the field of blood. And then in verse 20, it says, In verse 24, it is written in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric, his office, his ministry, let another take. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, that he, another person they were going to choose now to replace him, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which, look at this, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. He fell and he has gone to his own place. Which place? The place of the betrayer. Which place? The place of the traitor. Which place? The place of a person that died in sin. Which place? The place of hell. Hell fire forever and ever. That brings us to point number two here. On that this uh, perdition awaiting uh, the repentant betrayer, the willfulness of the betrayer. He was warned, and even after the warning, he was willful. He was determined. It was like a person that said, I, I don't care whatever will happen, and says, I don't care, hellfire, somebody must be there, I don't care, eternal suffering, willful. They willfully commit sin and they do the evil like somebody is going to do an evil thing. And, some, and the, you know, the other person is saying, if we do this, I about the judgment of God, I about this and I about that. Well, don't worry about that. The Lord will forgive us. They are willful in their sinning. Look at Mark chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 10. It says, in verse 14, and Judas is called one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest. After I had been warned, after he had heard that it were better that one were not born, he went unto the, unto the chief priest and to betray him unto them. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and when they heard it, they were glad. And he promised to give him money, and he sought how he might conveniently betray him. I come to Matthew chapter 26. We're reading from verse 14. The willfulness of the betrayer, the willfulness of the backslider, the willfulness of the apostate, and the willfulness of the hypocrite. It says in Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 14, Then one of them, one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest, and in verse 15 it says, And said unto them, What will ye give me? I can, I can do the service, any service. I can fish him out for you. I can point him out to you. I can betray him to you. Can you do that? If he's looking at you, you're being with him, he recognizes you. Can you do that? Are you going to cover your face? Are you going to hide? He said, no, I'm going to do it. I, if you promise me the money, I will deliver him unto you. All right, and they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And then he tells us in verse 16, in verse 16, and from that time he sought opportunity, from that time he sought a convenient time, from that time he sought for a chance to betray him. It was a willful, willful sinner, and willful backslider, and willful apostate, and willful betrayer. How could he do that? How could somebody have that kind of boldness and that kind of courage? And after all the warnings, how could somebody have that kind of effrontery and do that? Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, you see the reason now, and it is in verse 3. Luke chapter 22, verse 3, Then 
entered Satan into Judas, named so named Iscariot. That's the receive. That's why he could have that kind of uh, boldness and that kind of willfulness because Satan entered into him. I pray for you that Satan will not enter into you. Satan will not possess you. Satan will not control you. Satan will not have you like a captive and use you like an instrument that will destroy what the Lord himself has raised up and then entered Satan into Judas, so named Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. After that, Satan entered into him. Look at verse 4. And he went his way, and he communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, and they were glad. The same thing, the same thing, but it's just telling you the power behind it the inspiration behind him, the satanic uh, influence within him that made him to do what he did. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And now as you go on to verse 6, it says in verse 6, and he promised and he sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Look at that. He feared the multitude more than he feared God. He feared the multitude more than he feared Christ. And he feared, he protected himself from the multitude rather than thinking about who Christ is. He feared the multitude. Now he was willful. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 26. It says, for if we sin willfully, not only really Judas Iscariot, it's possible for any other person, after knowing the truth, after professing to be saved, after knowing Jesus Christ, after saying, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, after hearing all the warnings, after reading all the scriptures, after hearing everything we read about in Mark chapter 13, about the rapture, about the time of the great tribulation, about the coming of Christ, and about what the Antichrist will do, after hearing and learning all that, if we sin willfully, like Judas Iscariot, after that we have received the knowledge knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sin. Look at verse 27. It says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. The betrayer is now an adversary. The backslider is now an adversary. And the profligate is now an adversary. The prodigal now becomes an adversary. The apostate who leaves the way of righteousness and stubbornly and willfully goes in the way of sin now goes uh, like an adversary and the judgment of God and the foreign indignation will devour the adversaries. And then in verse 28, it says in verse 28, He that despiseth Moses' Lord died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, it says of how much sorrow punishment, it says of how much severer punishment, it says how much more fiery punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of Man, who has rejected the Son of Man, trampled over the Son of Man, and who has said, well, I betray him anyhow. I don't care about the warning. I don't care about uh, the consequence of what will come. And now we'll tread over the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Look at that. He was saved. He was sanctified. Wherewith he was sanctified. Wherewith he was redeemed. Wherewith he was ransomed. And wherewith he was cleansed and brought near to the Savior. He was uh, sanctified and he now counts that blood that sanctified him an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. Then it says in verse 30, in verse 30 it says, for we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31 says, 
It is a fearful seed. It is a painful seed. It is an eternally hurtful seed, harmful seed, dangerous seed to fall into the hands of the living God. We've seen the warning for the betrayer. We've seen the willfulness of the betrayer. Now the woe for the betrayer. We're coming back to Mark. And in Mark chapter 14, we're reading from verse 21. Mark chapter 14, we're reading from verse 21. The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him. Judas, you understand? Whatever happens will not go beyond what has been written of him. The people who are sinners should understand that. And persecutors of believers should understand that. And the people that willfully go on in wanting to oppress the people of God should understand. They cannot go beyond what has been written. And whatever has not been written of him will not be done. And the Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man, Jonas Iscariot, woe to that man, betrayer, woe to that man, apostate, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for, for that man if he had not been born. Woe to that man. Look at Luke chapter 22 from verse 21. Luke chapter 22, we're reading from verse 21. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 21, But behold, the hand of him that betrayed me is with me on the table. And then in verse 22, in verse 22, truly, the Son of Man goeth, look at this, as it was determined. Whatever God has not proposed, whatever God has not determined, will not happen will not happen to Christ, will not happen to the apostle, will not happen to the believer, will not happen to you, will not happen to me. Whatever happens, that is what God has determined. Your life is not in the hand of Satan. And your life, your destiny, is not in the, in the hand of Judas Iscariot, of a betrayer. Only what God allows will happen. And we need to praise the Lord for that. And truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. It says it over and over. The woe for the betrayer. In Jude chapter 1, Jude chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 11. Woe unto them. Judas has out, woe unto them. Cain, woe unto them. Balaam, woe unto them. Korah, woe unto them. It says woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gate saying of Korah. In verse 12, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity. You know, Jesus is called, came in among the eleven, making the twelve. And Jesus was there, and they were holding the feast of the Passover. He said, I'm still here too, and one of you too. But he was a spot, a blemish in that feast of the Passover. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Jonas Christ was there. He had no fear. He had no apprehension, even though he knew that Jesus could have the word of knowledge and Jesus could single him out and Jesus even said, one of you will betray me. He was there with, you know, boldness, sinful boldness, satanic boldness, without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without wood, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. It says in verse 13, in verse 13, reaching waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, wandering, a uh, wonder to the chief priests, a uh, wonder to the uh, council, a uh, wonder to all those other assemblies. I can, you know, I'm there, I'm also here, I'm for him, I'm also for you, wandering about and seeing how he will betray the Lord Jesus Christ, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's the word, that's the word, that's the judgment, the blackness of darkness forever. It tells us in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, and I'm reading here from verse 27. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness outwardly. Uh, you know, you're called Judas is called a disciple. Even all the rest, the eleven of them, they didn't understand. They didn't know that was different outwardly. It was like a whited sepulchre. And now in verse 28, in verse 28, it says, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Look at the result, the woe upon such people and upon Judas Iscariot and people like Judas Iscariot in verse 33. In verse 33, ye serpents in the green grass, ye serpents hiding ye serpent that are just there and those people and the people will not know until they bite them. Ye serpent see generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? That's the war. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. Revelation chapter 14, we're looking at verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented, Judas is carried, and he shall be tormented, apostate, and he shall be tormented, the betrayer, and he shall be tormented, the unrepentant sinner, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. It says in verse 11, in verse 11, and the smoke of their torment, the smoke of the torment of Satan and of the fallen angels and the false prophets and of the beast and of Judas is carried and people like Judas is carried and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever when Jesus said, Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. The woe means eternal judgment, eternal punishment in the fiery indignation of God, and they shall be tormented, and the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever, and whosoever, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Today we have learned about uh, this uh, word of God preparation for the last Passover. And we have seen uh, how that woman came and poured a costly ointment upon the head of Jesus and is teaching us, bring everything you have and who you are, your talent, your ability, your past, your present, and everything you can do. The best you are in life, bring everything and pour it upon the Lord Jesus Christ and serve God without reservation. Others may complain why that ways and why are we pouring that on Christ? Don't mind them. Just continue and there will be a record for you in the book of life in heaven. And then the final scene, the Passover, that first Passover has taken place, the final Passover has taken place, and we've seen the fulfilled Passover. Let there be no leaven of hypocrisy or no leaven of the Pharisees in your life and no leaven of the works of the flesh in your life and come and be purged and be cleansed and then serve the Lord now in righteousness and holiness all the days of your life and then avoid the war, the calamity and the warning that the Lord had given to Judas is God so that by the grace of God you will not be a backslider. Give me a good amen there. Amen. And you will not be an apostate. You will not be a betrayer. And you will not be a willful sinner, a willful backslider, a willful profligate person. You will not willfully just say headlong going on in evil. You say, I'll serve the Lord. I'll be holy. I'll be righteous. I'll take the promise of God that Jesus Christ offered himself so that all my sins can be forgiven. All my sins can be cleansed. I can live a righteous life, a holy life. From now henceforth, I will love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. The Lord will help you. Let's close our Bibles now. Please stand up wherever you are, if you can, 
and then close your eyes and let us pray unto the Lord. Let's see what the Lord has done today. And let us bring everything we have learned unto the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. He will. He will. As you now offer the price of anointing Jesus, his unblemished head, his unblemished body, offer unto the Lord. And forget what your opposers say. And forget what persecutors say. And forget what detractors say. And say, Lord, I offer everything everything unto you. Examine your service. Is it costly enough? Examine your sacrifice. Is it costly enough? Examine your love for Christ. Is it costly enough? Examine how you are serving the Lord. Are you taking life easy? And you say you are serving the Lord and you are offering what is not useful and what is not profitable? Are you giving all your love, the best of your life, the best of what you have, and the best of your talent, and the best of your uh, ability? Even what people, so-called Christians, backsliders, what would they complain about? Are you giving your all to the Lord? Pray and say, Lord, I lay everything upon the altar again. My costly sacrifice I lay on the altar my costly price I lay on the altar and everything, every ability I have, every skill I have, I lay on the altar. The knowledge I have, the certificate I have, I lay everything on the altar. Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I will serve you. Whatever comes, whatever goes, whatever the complaint of people will not understand, I will not wait for anyone's understanding. I will serve you and offer the very best unto you. They'll complain, I'll not listen. They'll detract, I'll not listen. And they'll do whatever, speak whatever, slander, I will not listen. They'll call it a waste, I'll not listen. A waste of life, a waste of time, a waste of resources, I'll not listen. I'm going to pour everything on Christ. And then I shall come under the cleansing of the blood, under the covering of the blood of the Lamb, the spotless Lamb of Jesus Christ. You want to keep yourself without spot, without wrinkle. You want to keep yourself without leaven, leaven of insincerity and leaven of hypocrisy and leaven of a little sin or little evil. You want to keep yourself from every appearance of evil. And you want to keep yourself holy, righteous and godly all the days of your life not excusing any sin and not excusing any work of the flesh. You want to say, Lord, I bring everything. I lay my all on the altar. I will serve the Lord without allowing, without permitting even the smallest and the least of leaven of insincerity and error in my life. There will be the uneven bridge of sincerity and of truth. And I will serve the Lord with a transparent life a transparent, uh, is tra transparent uh, service. And now beware, beware of backsliding. Beware uh, the warning came to the betrayer. He wasn't careful. And the willfulness of the betrayer uh, saying, I will do it anyhow. Don't be like that. A Christian should have a tender conscience, should have a tender heart, and should have a tender heart for the Lord and for the work of God and for the church of the living God. Don't be like Judas Iscariot that will push all the warning aside and then be willful in disobedience and willful in sinfulness and willful in backsliding because of the woe that will come upon the one that died in sin, upon the one that dies in evil that will come upon the willful, disobedient, transgressors of the word of God, because it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A fearful thing for a person to put Jesus down, to trample on Jesus, to walk over Jesus, to sell Jesus, to sell the gospel of Jesus, to sell the church of Jesus, and to sell the standard of the word of God, and to sell Calvary, and to push everything away, and say, I must make money anyhow. I must make, you know, profit anyhow. Take warning, and don't be willful in backsliding, so the woe of the backslider will not come upon you. Rededicate yourself today, and reconsecrate yourself today, and lay everything upon the altar once again today and say, Lord, I thank you 
I sacrifice again everything. I give everything once again, everything unto you. The Lord answer your prayer. And the Lord accepts your consecration. And the Lord accepts all the profession you are making. And everything you lay on the altar without sin, without hypocrisy, without evil. The Lord accepts you and your consecration in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this hour. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for the word you have spoken unto us. And thank you for what we have learned today. Thank you because you are reminding us again. You said everywhere this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. This that the woman has done will be mentioned. And we have mentioned it today. So that we can follow this good example. Lord, like that woman brought her own alabaster box of ointment. Very precious, very costly. Like he poured everything upon you. Lord, today we bring our love. All the love we have. We bring our talent, all the talent we have. We bring our resources, all the resources we have. And we bring everything you've given to us. We pour upon you and upon the gospel, upon the ministry. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, will not hold back our consecration, our commitment. will not hold back anything, but we pour everything on you. Whatever the complaints of the people, whatever the insinuations of the people, everything will bring back unto you to sacrifice everything we've got unto you from today and henceforth in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, because you uh, observed that last Passover and we've seen the first Passover, the last Passover, and the fulfilled uh, Passover. And you have told us now to worship you and to serve you without any leaven and to be under the mark of the blood of the Lamb. And you have said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When you see the blood has cleansed us and the blood is covering us and the blood is protecting us and the blood is sanctifying us and the blood is preserving us and presenting us to you holy, righteous, and without blemish. You said, ours will be the kingdom of God. We are praying, O oh Lord, the blood of the Lamb will do everything it ought to do in our lives and present us without blemish unto you on the final day in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, none of us who have started with you will not backslide, will not look back will not sell you for money, will not sell you for position, will not sell you for politics, will not sell you for anything at all, but with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, we we'll love the Lord, we we'll love his gospel, we we'll love Christ our Savior, and we we'll love the people of God, and Lord, we will continue in the way of the Lord. In Jesus' name, everyone you have given us, we're going to observe, and we're not going to be willful in going on in any bad, evil, evil habit in Jesus' name, that woe will not be ours, judgment will not be ours, fiery indignation will not be ours, but when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we shall also be caught up to be with them, none of us will miss at that time of resurrection and rapture in Jesus' name. We pray that your presence will be with us, your power will be with us, your protection will be with us, and we'll continue serving you without looking back until the very end of our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. The Lord be with you. And the Lord permit that every good thing we have learned today will be translated into your life fully in Jesus' name. Thank you, and God bless you. Good night.